Welcome to the Small Business Success Channel. My name is Chris Green. I'm a business lawyer uh, and an advisor to small business. My passion is assisting entrepreneurs in structuring and growing their businesses. Now, my purpose today is to provide an entry-level discussion concerning business structures in hopes of assisting someone new to the wonderful world of business to make the appropriate choices. Now, but before I do, I, I do have to do the lawyerly thing and put out some disclaimers. Let's call them weasel words. Okay. Firstly, my comments are of a general nature only, and it should not be considered as a substitute for obtaining appropriate legal and accounting advice when setting up your business. Secondly, I practice law in British Columbia, Canada, and my remarks are geared to someone starting a business here. Our audience for this show, of course, is worldwide, as people log on from everywhere. And while most of my commentary will have universal applicability, if you aren't from BC, you will want to check with a professional in your home jurisdiction. Okay, so you're going to start a business. Now what? Well, just as when you begin to build a house, you have to begin with the foundations. With a business, you have to begin with the initial form of business organization that you're going to use. Now, often I find that the people who are new to business or to self-employment are tempted to try to reinvent the wheel. You know, their business is going to be unique. Its structure is going to be like nothing that's ever been seen before on the planet. A new style of business uh, entity for the new millennium, that sort of thing. Well, if you're one of those sorts of people, here's a bit of free legal advice. Just don't do it. You know, there's only a limited number of ways that you can do business, and they've all long since been invented. Okay, so what are your choices? Well, essentially you have four. You've got proprietorship. You have partnership, you have a variation of that called a limited liability partnership, and finally you have a limited liability company. Now, it's true that some combination of these basic business forms can be combined into a more exotic business structure, such as a co-op, a limited partnership, or a joint venture, and so forth, but these are really beyond the scope of this discussion. Complex business structures are typically employed when an existing business wants to move to the next level of expansion and is not done in the initial startup phase of a business. Now, when somebody comes to see me to discuss the formation of a new business, here's some of the questions that I ask. Firstly, what's the nature of the business that you're going to be conducting? What I'm really asking is, how risky is your business going to be? Now, risk can mean physical risk. I've got to manufacture fireworks, as an example, or financial risk. I need to purchase or lease expensive equipment or maintain an extensive inventory, again, for example. Second question I ask is, what's your budget? How much can you afford, both initially and annually, to create and maintain your business structure? Thirdly, how many of you are going to go into business together? Lastly, how do you intend to finance this startup? Are you going to be soliciting money from friends and family, using your own, or other people's money? These consider considerations will all factor into your choice for an appropriate business structure. To show you why, let, let's review the main attributes of each of these forms of business organization. Let's start with proprietorship. Okay? Now, a proprietorship is simply doing business on your own account. All of the income earned is your personal income. All of the expenses from the business are personal to you as well. So, for example, if I decide to hang up my shingle and go into business for myself as Chris Green, barrister and solicitor, my desk, my computer, and so forth are all bought with my own money. They remain my own property. And I'm personally responsible as well for all of the expenses of the business, the rent, the phones, the staff, the supplies. The fees generated by that business belong, of course, to me. They're going to be reported on my personal income tax return on a calendar year basis. Now, if I sign an office lease, it's going to be in my name. The HST account is also going to be in my name. Uh, but wait, your law firm is called Greenway Legal Center, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's right. But that business name is just a business alias for myself, for the, the individual running the proprietorship. Now, most proprietors do adopt a trade name for marketing purposes, although there's no requirement for them to do so. But they're still doing business on their own account. Now, while you don't need any official permission 
to adopt a business name, just as you're free to use any alias or any nickname that you care to in your personal life, there's a little legal wrinkle that will probably force you to register your trade name. Now, it is that, that banking regulations won't permit a bank to open an account for you without proof that you are the owner of that business name. In BC, the registration process is really quite easy. You reserve the name for $30, you fill in the proprietorship registration form, and you submit it with a registration fee of $50. This can all be done now online uh, on a website called www.bconestop.com. They call it One Stop because you can register for all the government services uh, you may need. WorkSafe BC, Provincial Sales Tax, HST, Export Permits, and so forth. So, to review, proprietorship is the simplest form of business organization. It's cheap and simple, but what are the downsides? Well, since you're doing business on your own account, you have no liability protection. Your personal assets are fully exposed to your, the creditors of your business. Further, you have no name protection. The registration of a trade name with the government does not effectively protect your name. You also have no ability to defer taxes. Okay. Now, in light of that, when would you use proprietorship as your preferred form of organization? Well, if someone wanted to start a sideline business, something perhaps home-based, which offered a service rather than a product, might be well served with a proprietorship. Businesses with a low cost of entry, let's say a consulting business, would also be a likely candidate. And if you're simply testing out your business idea for proof of concept before you fully commit to the business, a proprietorship would make a lot of sense. You know, less risky ventures are best for a proprietorship form of organization. So ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen to my business? Could I hurt somebody or damage them financially by my business activities? Or is my worst case scenario simply that nobody might want my service and, and uh, uh, they wouldn't pay for it. Okay. Now, let's now discuss partnership. Partnership, simply put, uh, is two or more proprietors doing business together on their own account, usually using an adopted trade name or business alias. The partnership has the same features as the proprietorship, except that you're sharing the profits and loss with others, according to some formula agreed to between the partners. Your share of the partnership income is personal to you, and your share of the partnership expenses are also personal. There is, however, a very important wrinkle to consider in the event that things go bad. It is that partners are jointly and severally liable for partnership debts. What that means is that you are each fully responsible for the whole of the partnership debt, not just your partnership share of it. So, let's say your partner decided to bet the farm by ordering in a huge inventory of speculative product and the product doesn't sell. Or your partner commits the partnership to an expensive equipment lease. Well, it, it comes as a rude shock to many that a business partner can obligate you financially to decisions you haven't participated in or are even aware of. And believe me, Explaining that to your other partner at home can be a bit of a stretch at times. Now, how do you form a partnership? It can be as simple as a handshake and the registration of the partnership name, which is done in the same fashion as the proprietorship registration. Name reservation fee uh, and uh, uh, followed up by the $50 registration fee. The better practice, however, is to have a formal partnership agreement drawn up. Uh, in addition, or at the very least, to have an informally written agreement between the partners, just setting out what your expectations are uh, and what the, the rules of the game are going to be. You know, it's always more complicated doing business with others, so adopting this form of business structure deserves careful thought. Most partnerships are based on the, the one for all and all for one model where everything's split equally. This is fine in, in theory, but difficult to achieve in practice. It's rare to find two individuals whose skills, energy level, decision making, and so forth are all exactly equal. And any small imbalance in the partnership relation can 
quickly become a friction point, which after continuous rubbing can become an open wound. Now, you have to ask yourself, how are business decisions going to be made in the partnership on a day-to-day basis? And, and what happens if you can't agree on a course of action? What happens if one of you wants to leave or has to leave the partnership? What happens if you grow to loathe your partner or he or she dies or becomes disabled? You know, the law of partnership doesn't provide any easy or automatic answers for any of these situations, which is why the, the prudent thing to do is to have a formal partnership agreement in place that deals with some of these eventualities. The the joint and several liability issue that I referred to earlier has always been a great concern to, to lawyers and, and accountants and others who traditionally practice in a partnership because, of course, it can render them liable for the professional mistakes of their partners. Again, uh, uh, a partner screws up on a file you had no responsibility for and you're in the glue. So these concerns led recently in B.C. to the enactment of Part 3 of the Partnership Act, which provides that you can, subject to certain formalities, register your partnership as an LLP, or a Limited Liability Partnership, which limits your exposure to professional negligence claims against your partners. So the, the Limited Liability Partnership has become another recognized and common form of business organization, although its use presently is usually restricted to professional firms. That leads us to the last and and perhaps most common uh, or most popular form of business organization, the limited liability company. So let's start with some terminology. You've all seen or heard the phrase LTD, limited, corp, corporation, incorporated, inc, SA, GMBH, if you're from Europe, uh, they all mean the same thing, and they all indicate that a business is incorporated as a limited liability company, and, uh, of course, by law, a limited liability company must signify its status by using one of those terms at the end of its business name. Uh, The terms can be used interchangeably. They simply uh, reflect the status of the company. So, What exactly is a limited liability company? Well, it's a separate legal entity. It's an artificial legal person that is created by the government. Originally, limited companies were created by Act of Parliament. Famous companies such as the Hudson's Bay Company, or as it was then known, the Society for Gentlemen Adventurers Trading into Hudson's Bay, began life by an Act of Parliament. Uh, In modern times, of course, the the process has been considerably streamlined, and it's done upon application to the government along with the payment of the requisite uh, incorporation fee. Now, in B.C., the process is uh, quite streamlined. It's done online, and the incorporation fees are $345. When the limited company is created, uh, it's authorized to issue shares from its treasury. Now, until the new Business Corporations Act was brought in, we had to specify how many shares a company was authorized to issue from its treasury. For example, this company is authorized to have 10,000 common shares. Now, however, a company can be authorized to issue an unlimited number of shares, and that's usually what we do to avoid uh, issues in the future. So, The company sells shares from its treasury to interested parties, who become, of course, the shareholders. Traditionally, this is how companies raise the capital they needed, by selling shares to the public. And this process is still used by publicly traded companies today. Now, please note, however, that uh, private companies, small private companies, may not sell their shares directly to the public, uh, unless they comply with the provisions of the Securities Act. Now, the shareholders, once they become uh, owners of the shares, in turn will elect one or more directors who are given the authority to govern the affairs of the company on a day-to-day basis, uh, and who elect as well corporate officers such as the president and the secretary. Since a single person can incorporate a company, uh, then uh, in, in which case he or she would become the shareholder, the director, and the officer, just wearing all of the available hats uh, within the corporation. A company adopts a set of articles, in some jurisdictions they refer to them as bylaws, which act as a procedural rule book which governs the mechanics of how the companies run, how to conduct a meeting, and so forth. 
So what are the attributes of a limited liability company and why might we want to use that as a form of business organization? Well, first and foremost uh, is limited liability protection. The shareholders of a company are not, I repeat, are not liable for the debts of the company. The money that you've paid for your shares may well be lost, but that's the extent of your liability, and hence the name for this form of uh, business organization. And, uh, oh, and did I mention limited liability protection? This is a distinct contrast to what happens if you do business as a proprietorship when you're fully liable. So the, the next good reason to use a limited company would be name protection. A company, of course, can be incorporated without a name, in which case the incorporation number, uh, which is the number assigned by the corporate registry, becomes the corporate name. And this is what we refer to as a numbered company. However, usually a company will want to adopt a formal corporate name. Uh, and once a corporate name has been assigned, a corporation does enjoy a fair degree of protection for its corporate name, certainly far better protection than afforded to a proprietorship that has no protection at all. Now, many consider a limited liability company to be a better vehicle for doing business with multiple persons. Um, the Business Corporations Act and the articles of the company, they provide a bit of a rule book uh, as to how the shareholders must interact with each other. And, and there is some protection, some legal protection for minority uh, interests. <coughs> Now, a limited liability company is a separate legal entity. It's not the same as the shareholders. And, so, and as such, it's also a separate taxpayer. It's allowed to choose its own fiscal year end, and it files its own taxes. Uh, it reports and pays taxes on a different schedule than an individual. And this can lead to some opportunities to defer tax. I'll leave that discussion to our accountant friends in, in other episodes. Okay, similarly, family members can be issued shares or different classes of shares in a corporation which can permit income splitting. All in all, uh, there are usually tax advantages for doing business as a limited company. Now, in some cases as well, a limited company can assist in succession planning because you don't own the business, you own the shares of the company that owns the business. Now, lastly, the, the limited liability company is really the only vehicle that's suitable for raising money on a large scale by way of a publicly traded company uh, uh, or even a, a private placement. Well, this is a very complex area, which is, of course is, is beyond the scope of this chat. <coughs> now, the incorporation process, how do you incorporate a company? Well, uh, fairly simple. First, you reserve the corporate name. Next, you prepare an incorporation application, and you submit it via the Internet uh, together with the incorporation fees of $345. Upon receipt of confirmation of the company's registration, the incorporating shareholders convene a first meeting of the shareholders in order to allot shares, appoint the ongoing board of directors, establish a records office, uh, and so forth. Next, a minute book, which is typically a black three-ring binder, uh, is prepared that contains all the original corporation documents and contains a register of who the shareholders and the directors are and uh, contains a record of the transactions that the company undertakes. Okay, So let's just review. We have a proprietorship, a very simple, uh, straightforward method of doing business. We have a partnership, uh, which again, quite simple, except for the fact that it involves uh, doing business with others, which has its own set of complications. We had the variant of that being a limited uh, liability partnership, an LLP, um, which uh, is still a partnership structure, but one which permits uh, uh, individual partners to shield themselves from some of the uh, uh, bad decisions of, of their partners. Lastly, the limited liability company. Now, uh, and again, that uh, uh, is a business structure with a certain amount of formality. Uh, it, it's a, a certain amount of longevity. Uh, the existence of a company can be uh, perpetual. Uh, and uh, it's probably a better uh, 
better suited for a business which is on a growth spurt and intends to take on additional uh, uh, participants uh, to take the, the, the company uh, to the next level. Now, although business can, can change its business structure as it grows and changes, I mean, for example, a, a proprietorship can morph into a partnership when, when it uh, brings in uh, uh, business partners, um, or a, 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 a partnership uh, can become incorporated when it becomes large enough to, to warrant the extra expense. But it's still important to carefully select the appropriate business structure at the outset if you can. Okay? So for that reason, in addition to uh, digesting what we've told you here today, I'd, really, I'd urge you to discuss your plans with a local lawyer or an accountant. Um, you know, really, an initial discussion uh, is cheap insurance against screwing it up. Now, uh, now I'm, I'm told we have a few questions from our viewers, uh, so if, if we have the time, uh, uh, perhaps you could put them up for me. Thanks. Um, first question, I'm, I'm already doing business as a proprietorship. Uh, when or why should I incorporate? Okay. Well, I, I guess the, the, the very first thing to look at uh, is um, how comfortable are you uh, with the, the level of risk that you're incurring with your business? Uh, uh, are you being required to sign uh, large financial commitments uh, in your own name because of the, uh, the fact you're doing business as a proprietorship? Um, what's your income level? Okay, if, if, you're, uh, if your net revenues from your business are pushing up over about $40,000 annually, uh, you're probably getting into the range where your accountant can achieve some, some tax savings for you uh, by incorporating. Um, another big issue would be um, succession planning. Now, um, if you are thinking about retiring, uh, hoping to sell the business and, and get some equity out over the next three or four years, you would definitely want to think about incorporating your business. Uh, you've, there's things such as a lifetime capital gains exemption that exists that, that uh, uh, it makes a, a lot of sense to, uh, uh, to want to incorporate. I um, hope that answers your question, sir. Um, next question. Um, I tried to register my business name, and the registrar of companies rejected the application. So what do I do now? Okay. Now, I can't really tell from the question whether uh, the, the caller was trying to register a proprietorship name or a limited company name. Now, the BC government maintains really two databases. Uh, the corporate name reservation database is considered the senior database. So um, if uh, a name or a name similar to the one you want has already been assigned to a limited company and you are applying to the junior proprietorship database for a reservation, you're going to be out of luck. So if there's already a J&B Drywall LTD uh, incorporated, then uh, you're not going to get that name as a proprietorship. Uh, what you can do is, is play around with slight variations of the name. Um, you might, uh, if, if you like you know, Pacific Drywall LTD and there's already a Pacific Drywall, try North Pacific Drywall or uh, something of that name because uh, your your formal corporate name doesn't necessarily have to be, be the street name that you use uh, when you're uh, doing business. So um, slight variations can often uh, smoke a name reservation past the registrar of companies. The only time you'd really want to think twice about per persisting would be if there is an obvious uh, uh, challenge going to be made. If there's a well-known company that has a very, very similar name, uh, you probably don't even want to go there because uh, they're going to take you on if they find you using their name or something that, that could be confused with their name. Now, I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay, How much does it cost to incorporate and why should I pay a lawyer um, if, I can, if I can do it myself? Uh, the website, uh, government website looks pretty simple. Well, of course, aside from the fact that we lawyers have to make a living too, um, there are some very good reasons why you'd want to. Um, firstly, um, 
the the government website only tells you half the process. And what we find with uh, most do-it-yourself incorporations is that some very essential steps have been missed by the do-it-yourselfer. They, they've forgotten to do all the post-incorporation minutes. They haven't uh, issued shares to anyone. Uh, they haven't set up the proper uh, uh, shareholders registry. We call it a central securities register. Um, often, uh, these faults don't become evident for a number of years until uh, the company goes to borrow money from the bank and the bank says, so, where's your minute book? And, of course, you don't have one. Uh, so uh, the, the lawyer service really is a value-added service in the incorporation process. Yes, you can do it yourself if you've got access to a computer and a visa card, um, but you don't get the full package. So um, the, the cost of an incorporation is not great, uh, and I'd urge you to use a lawyer to, to do that, uh, uh, simply make sure it's getting done right the first time. Well, that's it for today's show. I, I hope I've given you some valuable information that will prove useful. Now, if you have any questions on today's show, please do send me an email or, or visit my website, and it's uh, recorded over here. Uh, until next time... Uh, and we'll talk to you about uh, uh, retrieving what's owed to your business in small claims court. That's it for today's show. We hope you got some useful information that will help you grow your business. If you have any questions on this week's topic, feel free to contact our guest speaker directly by email, which is shown on the left of your screen. If you have any suggestions for future shows, we'd love to hear from you. So till next time, keep on learning.